Good evening, everybody. Today, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, man. Already, already coughing up a lung. Today is July 27th, 2022. It is a delightful 82 degrees Fahrenheit outside. It is in upstate New York. It is humid. It's been hot. It's been awful. Can't wait for us to adopt nothing but friggin' windmills and solar panels so that way we can reduce some of this friggin' heat. Because let me tell you something, I love skiing and I love the snow and mother of God, it has been murderously hot. I don't know how the birds outside are surviving. I don't know how the squirrels stay hydrated. I barely managed to survive in 75 degree weather, so the fact that it's 82 is killing me. Anyway, today's drink of choice. Let's get a nice visual while I'm doing this. Today's drink of choice is Swiftwater Kolsch. It is a German-style Kolsch beer. It is produced by Swiftwater Brewing. They are out of 378 Mount Hope Avenue, Rochester, New York, zip code 14620. It is delightful. Let's give it a taste test to give you a live sampling. Mmm. Mmm. That's very nice. It's very, very nice. The initial taste a little hoppy. Not too much. You get a hint of it. It's a very rounded flavor. A little earthy. You definitely taste the malt. Not too hoppy, which I like. I, I'm not a fan of IPAs. I think they're just not for me. Um, that is rather nice. You can taste the hops. They're there. They give it a nice kind of citrusy kick, but it, they're not. They're definitely a, um, a supporting character, so to speak. The mid taste is refreshing. The swallow, <laughs> wink, wink, is very nice, malty, semi-sweet doesn't have a weird aftertaste which a lot of beer struggles with that is a very refreshing for a daily today i would drink that again anyway this is field command napoleon and this is the most recent patch it is delightful this is kind of getting towards the end of the development of the mod um chewy the lead dev has announced that the next patch is basically going to be the definitive patch for the mod if not the next and the one after that there may be a small hot fix coming out to change one or two things uh, but otherwise, the mod is essentially complete, and I love that. Uh, there's been a lot of work done to the mod, and you may even notice some things out of the gate, like musket textures have been kind of redone to make them a little more glinty, and this is important because you can kind of see them from a little further away. Um, you know, anyone who does tabletop gaming knows that you want to emphasize details on models, so that way from a distance they look really cool. And uh, if you look from far away, sorry, there's people outside my window. Um, if you look from far away, look at the glint of those bayonets. They look awesome, and you could even see them here, and... You know, we just zoom in a little bit, despite the uniforms going off. Yeah, that looks really, really good. Um, it's just a really nice visual enhancement, and it adds a little bit of a razzle-dazzle. A few other things have changed. Skirmishers have been limited to one pick per uh, per unit. So if you can get, you know, Swiss Jaegers, shall we say, um, you can only take one of those. But their accuracy has been increased quite substantially. So now riflemen really hit, but you can only take one, so they're exceptionally rare. Um, so now riflemen are really buying their, their weight back in shots. You can use a rifle unit to pick off artillery crews. Finally, they're viable in terms of shooting from a forest or a flank and, uh, you know, outranging the enemy and attriting them. Um, sniping elite units down. Rifles are really in the spot they should be in, which is nice. Um, if you hear beeping, my apologies. Um, my laundry has just finished. So, you know, got to love some hygiene. What are they, you know, hey, it's part of the our army life, right? You have to have good hygiene. Otherwise, you get the, uh, the Hershey squirts via dysentery. Anywho, um, that's one of the changes in the mod. Um, otherwise, just a few other ch touches. I think my favorite ed uh, edit for this version of Field Command Napoleon is the fatigue system. Fatigue has been reworked just a smidge. The cooldown to start regaining energy for units has been reduced. And let me tell you something. What a fantastic change that is. Because now it makes sense to have a fresh division in reserve to relieve a line. Um, you can have a brigade of troops, a division of your troops, uh, uh, yeah, about a brigade or two of your troops um, attack the enemy. Do a ton of strenuous movements, charges, uh, running under fire, so on and so forth, repositioning, whatever. Storming a house, you name it. And it makes sense, finally, finally, to have uh, a number of units in reserve nearby to assume um, the new front line and let those troops that are now tired and, and depleted from that assault or maneuver, what have you, come back and rest for a little bit so that way they can become refreshed and at least up to active or winded in energy state before re-entering the battle. So letting your troops come back and refresh themselves and rest for a little bit before re-engaging the enemy 
is a real viable tactic now. And you'll see people do that a lot in the uh, next coming few replays, which is friggin' awesome. And I love that because, you know, me, I love this sort of nuance in games where it doesn't necessarily add another layer as much as it does enhance gameplay, because that's just something you think naturally, right? Okay, we just have these guys run forward in the bayonet charge. They're all probably pretty tired. Let's give them a second to rest. Well, now you can be rewarded for thinking like that. Finally. So that's the first thing. And then um, the next thing I wanted to say, this is a quick announcement. I don't want to be too long-winded about this. I just want to say thank you all so terribly, terribly much because we have somehow hit almost 250 subscribers. And you maniacs like this content so goddamn much that you've watched more than 1,600 hours of it. Uh, I can't tell you how chuffed my biscuit is reading these statistics because I do this purely as a passion project. I'm not doing this to switch my full-time job to it. I would not like to be a full-time YouTuber. Um, I'm actually preparing to go to law school next year. I'm preparing to take the LSAT. Um, I do not want to do this as a full-time job. I do this totally as a passion project, as a hobby. Um, the fact that people enjoy it so much is just icing on the cake. And I think that's kind of the spark of the channel, that it's not something I do for serious uh, reasons. It's not something I do for an income. It's something I do because I enjoy it. And I think that's very noticeable. And I think that's why people like it so much. It's because it is so genuine and there is no ulterior motive aside from entertainment. That being said, there are some upgrades I would like to do to the channel because now that I'm realizing how many people like this, I'm getting <laughs> actual fan mail uh, from people, which is very flattering, um, in Discord DMs, in comments, and personal messages. Um, I'm realizing that maybe I should be a little more serious about the content in terms of production quality. Um, there are a few things I'd like to do. The thing is, it costs money to do that. And I'm a mid-20s man paying student loans and rent. Um, these things are not expensive, but I would help a lot if we could somehow share the cost of it. So what am I asking? To put it bluntly, what I'd like to do is monetize the YouTube channel. Um, I don't want to be annoying about it. I don't want to be overbearing. I'm not going to sit here and sell you mobile apps. But what I'm certainly suggesting is I'd like to get up to 1,000 subscribers and get up to 4,000 viewed hours because that means we can monetize the channel. And what that means is I can take money from the monetization and put it towards things like uh, Streamlabs OBS Prime, which is, I, I use Streamlabs as the software I use to record these videos. They have a premium version for $20 a month. And if I get the premium version, there are several uh, plugins that I can get for free through my premium subscription to Streamlabs that would greatly enhance the quality of production uh, of these videos. So monetizing it means for you, what you get out of it is a better channel. You get a bunch of just better produced videos, um, better content and so forth. And what I would like to do as well is be a little more consistent with the output of videos. I'd like to do one every two weeks. Um, I don't want to do one a month. I know I've been typically doing one, maybe two a month. Um, life is just busy. I work a full-time job. I have a social life. I'm preparing, you know, I'm studying to take the LSAT. Um, life is busy, but you know, I really enjoy these things and I like the fact that so many other people enjoy them. And I always find when I sit down and start recording, I really always have a great time doing it. So it's kind of a cathartic therapy for me in some ways too. So I'd like to do it more often. And if I'd like to do it more often, then I'd like to increase the quality of it. But if I want to increase the quality of it, I do need to put some money down. And I think, you know what, like, I'm not going to sit here and ask everyone who watches for 20 bucks, but I think if we have 250 people, you know, if just a, ha a shred of those people put down a dollar in like a Patreon or something, then I can really put that money into getting some really cool stuff for this channel, like Streamlabs uh, uh, Premium OBS. And then I can possibly upgrade the microphone to give you even better audio quality. Um, I could perhaps upgrade some components on my PC to drastically increase the graphical quality of the recordings. Um, I'd also like to host some tournaments with money involved, um, you know, like, you know, $20 to the winner or something. And, you know, there's a bunch of things that I'd like to do for the community because ultimately this channel, what it has turned into is not so much me doing my own thing, but rather it's become a hub for the F and community um, culture, as well as other historically inclined YouTube member uh, uh, viewership like myself, um, that I think, you know, it'd be kind of cool to organize stuff with the community that maybe, you know, you get a free Steam gift card out of it. Um, you get a Steam game out of it, you know, stuff like that. So it'd be kind of fun. Anyway, with all that being said, I think it's time to delve into the content of today's video. So why am I showing you this replay in specifics? Well, let's kind of dive into the mechanics here, the zoom out. There are three very distinct wings of the French army in the field right now. There's a northern wing, so this this way is north. That's this map of the, the border here. And let's see if this pen thing that I have that I jerry-rigged works. I have a bit of a pen tool I'm going to use to try to write on the screen. Let's see. Oh, it works. Cool. Okay, so there is roughly three wings. There's the uh, center, which is C. There's going to be the right wing, and then there's going to be the left wing, right? Um, and if we look at how they're, how the, uh, the map works here, um, if you look to the top right, I'm going to divide here. So center, 
Uh, that's the left wing, and this is the right. Uh, wow, that's a horrible R. Jesus, I gotta practice. Um, <clears throat> there's some major formations that dominate the battlefield. Let's use the red pen for this, or a magenta pen. Um, there's this hill. There is this kind of ridge line up here, and then there's kind of this little hilly area down there. Down in this quadrant of the map is lowlands, and that's kind of a trap because anyone who goes down there is effectively going to be fighting uphill. However, it's a double-edged sword because although they're in lowlands, that also means that anyone to the north of this area here is going to have a problem bringing artillery to bear on the lowland area. So it's kind of a catch-22. You don't want to be down there because it'll be difficult to get out, but you're also shielded from artillery fire and whatnot. So a bit of a strategic impasse in that one. It really depends on what the scenario is, or rather how it unfolds. But anyway, um, I am... Let's go back here. I am the right division over here. Oh, I can turn the camera around while I do this. How fun is that? I am, I'm sorry, I am the left division over here, aka in the north, so I am the left wing of the uh, French Corps here. Uh, my ally Heartless is the center, and then I forgot who was on the right, but we have a right wing here. Um, this replay I'm not showing you specifically because there is any sort of awesome, um, you know, expert S tier playing, but because it's an educational video. When I posted this replay in the Darth Mod Hardcore, or I'm sorry, Jesus, you know, old habits die hard, in the Field Command Napoleon Discord, um, several people asked me to do a video on this as actually a tutorial. Um, my opponents were not really on their A game today, so I want to point that out, that this is not me showing what a glorious, per you know, victory this is and how, you know, bad my opponents were. I'm showing you this because I think this is actually a really good example of a turning movement. And that's what the thumbnail implies, the turning movement, right? My army, my, my division, is split into brigades. Um, so let me kind of show you what I mean here. So if we go up to here and pull out our handy-dandy pen again, I've got my uh, first brigade and then my second brigade, and then I kind of have a reserve brigade back here. Um, I've also got some cavalry squadrons, which I shall highlight in yellow or cavalry brigades, I should say, and I have kind of this reserve up here. And then finally, in blue, I have two batteries of artillery, right? And you can kind of see, these things will change um, in a little bit, but you can see um, what I'm doing here, because basically these two divisions are poised to go up the northern edge of the map, and what I want to do is seize this ridgeline up here. So these are kind of going to be my spear tips, um, and I'm... I'm deployed really aggressively, um, very compact. I've got cavalry in the center. I've got my artillery out in the wings. I've got cavalry there, near there. I've got a reserve um, brigade of elite units, uh, the Dutch Grenadiers. I've got the Young Guard. I've got three very good French line infantry regiments. So um, it's just a very aggressive build here, specifically because I've also got six units of conscripts. Now, conscripts cannot form square, which is a dangerous thing. Um, if cavalry catches them out, they can be really shrecked really hard by a frontal charge, and that's to reflect the lower quality training they had. Yes, you might argue they should be able to form battalion mass uh, type square. However, just in the interest of balancing the gameplay a little bit, because otherwise conscripts would be a little overpowered, um, we've decided that we're just going to leave them the way they are. Uh, they're half as much as a line unit. They do a lot of work. It's just best to leave them the way they are. So anyway, that being said, why do I have six units of conscripts, right? If we run the math, I've got six units of fusiliers, six regiments of fusiliers. I'm um, another, uh, so yeah, three here and three there. And then I've got these three uh, uh, seasoned regiments and then these two seasoned regiments. So I've got six, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 um, units of infantry. And of that 17, six are conscripts. Um, that's quite a substantial ratio of non-squarable, low-quality troops. Well, the reason I'm doing that is because I want to be aggressive. And when you're aggressive, you take a lot of casualties. Whoever is attacking always takes more casualties. The defender always has the advantage because typically they can choose where they fight. They can fire the first volley. Um, we can assume that they've taken good ground. And I like conscripts specifically because they don't cost a lot. And this is an unfortunate um, reality of warfare in this time. Um, Men's lives were rated based on their training and how long they'd been in war, uh, their experience, as well as their equipment. And frankly, conscripts are just not worth that much. You know, and this is the human cost of warfare in this period. It's very brutal. And, uh, you know, when you're playing games like this, you're compelled to adopt the strategic 
perspectives of the people who fought these wars. And this is what they did. They used low quality troops to soften positions, to seize positions, so that way they could keep their more expensive, higher quality troops in reserve for when they were truly needed. And that is kind of a bit of a spoiler for what happens in the later part of this game. But, you know, you think of Napoleon's old guard. He didn't commit them at Borodino because he didn't want to lose them. Um, Waterloo, the old guard, was only sent in towards the end. Guard units and elite, well-trained, well-equipped, seasoned, uh, disciplined units are wasted in the early part of a battle because that's when things are the most dangerous and the most brutal. You save them to the end when you need a knockout blow. So as you can see, I've got my conscripts leading the way here, but they're always backed up. Uh, they're behind a, a, a front line of fusiliers here because I was a little more worried my cavalry was guarding this area so the cavalry can intercept a cavalry charge. But over here, I have less cavalry. So my fusiliers are guarding the, the conscripts. These guys can form squares and the conscripts can go inside the squares. Um, so... The idea here is that the conscripts are always supported. They're never on their own. We've got cavalry screening these guys, so they're in front. It's not a big deal. But we've got fusiliers in front of the conscripts here, so that way the conscripts can be safely escorted to the front line and then do their jobs. Anyway, um, let's just play the battle. Let's just press play. Um, we'll let the deployments play out. So that's my army, and while we're waiting for it to kick off, we'll look at my uh, allies here. Uh, actually, well, here, I'll just pause. Um, nothing too crazy to report here. It's just a bunch of French infantry. Um, some uh, battalions, uh, 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 chasseurs, <coughs> a brigade of chasseurs on the left. With some Swiss Jaegers. That's a nice maneuver element because those guys march fast. Uh, matched up with, of course, some elites, French grenadiers. We've got the young guard. We've got some Swiss units, but a bunch of fusiliers of line led by Sult. And then on the right, what are we looking at? We're looking at another horse artillery battery. Uh, horse artillery is nice because they maneuver uh, rather swiftly. Um, they're usually well-trained. So they're nice because they can rapidly move your base of fire. Um, and then over here on the right, we've got Murat with some cuirassier uh, with a bunch of, uh, just a mishmash of uh, French units. Uh, three attack columns, which is an interesting take backed up by grenadiers. This is a very angry uh, right wing for the French. Um, anyway, let's press play. So uh, because this is a tutorial video, I'll kind of explain what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Um, I'm putting my 12-pound battery on this hill because this is a very nice uh, hill. There's a low land in front of it with a forest, so if need be, I can put troops in that and have them concealed as reserves, but I can still shoot overhead. This hill has a nice command over this whole road. It's very cool. And also it can provide some aid to my ally. Uh, so my buddy over here on this side, he's going to rapidly move up. Uh, his horse artillery with a hussar escort, which is a very historically correct movement. Um, horse artillery is meant to amplify the fighting potential of cavalry brigades and divisions. So this is a very realistic thing to do, moving cavalry forward with horse artillery support. Half thematic. Video is a little choppy, but that's just because we have so many units in the field. And then over here... Um, my opponent accidentally ran some stuff, but that gives you, the viewer, a little second to see what's going on. So we're, we're it's a, a very thematic game because we, we all took suboptimal units, but fun builds. I took a bunch of conscripts, which is dangerous. You don't really want it. A lot of players are afraid to take conscripts because they can't square. Um, however, the uh, player, uh, Blucher, Blucher's division, shall we say, on, on uh, facing me in the north, as you could see, has a bunch of landwehr uh, that are chevroned up. That's a very dangerous thing because Landwehr are rather good at holding a line. They also can't square. They're kind of the, the opposite to French conscripts. French conscripts can't shoot for shit, but what they can do is uh, a hell of a bayonet charge. Landwehr can't really do a bayonet charge, but they can shoot rather well. Now in the center, it's a bit of a dangerous situation. The horse artillery has unlimbered and is now on the ground, but we've got two squadrons of Hungarian hussars. The uh, French player is going to intercept them a little bit there. I wonder if I can get this to be not as choppy. Oh, whatever. But this player is going to try to micro the battery. Um, however, they do get a little caught in this melee. Uh, the squadron is just coming in too sheer of an angle. However, luckily... We'll slow-mo this real quick. Oh, hold on one second. We have to do... The full glory. Here we go. Watch this. Oh, boy. Slow-mo it. Boom. Oh, my God. Jesus. Yeah, that'll do it. Oh, the ball hitting the ground. 
that's gonna... That stutters the charge and actually causes the unit to waver and then route. So a whiff of Grape Shot sees off that Hussar Squadron, which is quite nice. However, we do have the Frykor and Prussian Hussars coming in, and now these Hussars are a bit in trouble. Um, let's say Frykor can be matched by Hussars, which is not uh, an awful thing, but now we have more canister being fired into this melee, and although it does hit some of the French cavalry, it also sure as hell cores out these uh, life hussars who were just at full strength and caused his ender out too. So friendly fire here, unfortunately, but I'd consider that a good trade. One unit of good French hussars traded for what is effectively um, a bunch of enemy cavalry squadrons, and these hussars will come back, I do believe. So this is actually quite a good engagement for the uh, artillery or uh, for the uh, French center division. Over here, you could see where my movements are. Um, I'm marching my units in basically two columns through the wood line, and then I'm trying to form line of battle. I have my artillery moving up with the line, um, and I have my heavy cavalry moving forward to screen. Um, running, my hussars did get broken here uh, by the uh, Let's Off Rye Corps, but I just wanted to buy time for the artillery. Um, I am going to rescue them, though. Oh, no, they shattered. Never mind. I was thinking something else. Oopsie daisy. Now, my other cavalry is kind of interesting. I've got a heavy cavalry brigade of uh, uh, Mira, who's basically an uh, upgraded uh, cuirassier unit, matched with another cuirassier squadron. So what I effectively have are two squadrons of cuirassier with a hell of a morale buff. And with Ney, that's a pretty powerful uh, sledgehammer to have. I've got three units of hussars, which is nice. One of them broke, so I've got two left, but that's quite a substantial light uh, brigade. Now, over here on the right wing, who are we fighting here? So we have Scharnhorst in the south facing off against, who is this? Uh, the generic general staff in the southern, the French right division. And we could see he's got his assault columns in line. He's keeping his grenadiers in reserve. Um, what artillery did this player take? I don't even know if they took artillery. Oh, no, they did. Two horse guns. They haven't moved them yet. Got it. But very aggressive cavalry plays, and I think this is a mistake a lot of players make, is they see a horse artillery unit out in the open, and they think they can grab it by swamping it with cavalry. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that works. This was just a little too messy of an engagement, and it was too micro-heavy, and unfortunately the Prussian player was not able to get it. And so what's happening now is the enemy is providing a perfect target for bombardment um, to that battery. Look at all these, column, these lines coming in. Basically an echelon, if you look at it. Um... So now there's a bit of a problem over here. I'm using my Hussars to scout. I'm just trying to spot what's going on, but you can sort of see where the Prussians are going. They're putting some foot guards and land there, judging by where this unit is walking, over to their right. And uh, they're actually starting kind of uphill. They've got a hill to fall back on. If they put a battery up here, it could get pretty nasty. And I've got to walk uphill, and I'm actually behind schedule over here. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm effectively forming up in the line of battle. I'm falling out of March Column. And uh, my units are now kind of hidden, but some of them are coming out into the open, including my right, these conscripts, so that he knows where I'm going. So in the south here, this Prussian player is going to move forward and try to kind of give me a danger close situation and, and get the hill before I do. So these Hussars make another run to try to grab these Jaegers and then also this horse battery. But it's just asking too much of these men. They gotta run past a square, and then three regiments of French Fusiliers will fire into them, and Hussars. 50% casualties on the way in. That's a very dangerous gauntlet to run. And that's the thing about horse artillery, like I said earlier. Sometimes it's like dangling a shiny object in front of people. They see a horse artillery piece, and they think they can run it. Now, the Austrians have pulled up a 12-pound battery. Um, Austrian artillery is really not the best, to be honest with you. It's uh, relatively slow firing, but Austrian artillery is very accurate. So this will do some damage. Oh, wow, you can see the impact of that French artillery blowing holes. And actually, that's coming from uh, my guns over here that I placed. So these guns are able to provide a bit of a shot into the enemy. Now I'm going to pause here for a second because I want to draw on the screen. So what I'm doing here is I've got my batteries placed here and you see this lane of fire basically uh, through uh, the friendly uh, lines. I'm able to essentially throw shots here and if you look we've got this nice chunky target here. So if I take a ball and I just roll it through this uh, there's potential to hit two possibly three depending on the angle. Like this artillery piece perhaps could even hit three units depending on how it goes if there's anyone behind there. So this is a prime opportunity for artillery to fire. And, you know, these are not nuanced tactics. The way you should use artillery is you always want to optimize your shot. Shooting through one regiment 
is an inefficient use of artillery. Uh, you always want to try to get at least two regiments in the line of fire, and this is a great shot because not only is it two, but it's kind of at an angle. So if I could draw over here on the left, right? So like, let's say this is a line of two men shooting at it straight on is only going to hit the guy and uh, the the guy in the front and the guy behind him, right? Like, so if this guy here is the guy in the back uh, and the guy in front, you're only going to get those two. But if you shoot at him at an angle. You might hit two guys here and two guys here. So you're really doubling the amount of damage you're doing and disrupting the formation. And as we could see, if we go back to uh, the video here, if we look at the way the uh, artillery is falling, that's kind of what's happening. Look at this. See, this is exactly what I'm talking about. See how many bodies are from one ball? It looks like you get one, two, three, four. Textbook example of what I'm talking about. Whereas if it was head on, it might not hit that many. It's an even bigger show over here. Look at this. One cannonball. Look at this crazy dent in the formation. Um, again, it's not necessarily it's killing a lot of guys. It's just disrupting them and doing morale damage. And likewise, look at this. Imagine if this... Uh, if there was a battery here to shoot at this line, how incredible would that be? Anyway, let's press play. There's a charge happening somewhere, and I don't know. Oh, Jesus, did I just miss a charge? Oh, I missed the coolest charge of the game. Uh, my Hussars caught out this land bear column because my opponent's micro was split. Um, again, not to say that my opponent was bad. It's just there's a lot of stuff going on. And the amount of land bear that are walking into this Hussar squadron means that I physically cannot cut my way through it. These Hussars are wearing themselves out, killing land bear. 50% casualties on this one. Uh, small dent in that one. Small dent in that one. But you're looking at nearly a unit's worth of land bear being killed. In just this engagement, this brawl in the in the field in the tree line here, a very cool thing. I'm really sorry that I missed that. That was an awesome thing. But I actually have to pull that unit back. I let them chop a little bit, um, but I do have to pull them back because I want to save them. Um, luckily, they start routing, and that means they're going to get out of action. And there's enough men left, 53 out of 80, that they'll probably come back. Um, but look at all the the damage that they did. Pretty good. Now over here, uh, I'll pause for a second. Um, I got my guns up, and uh, my enemy is going to try to bayonet them. This is that danger close moment I was talking about, so you could see what I'm trying to do here. Um, so real quick, here's a tutorial that I was talking about. So what am I doing? So as you can see, here's my front line, right? You could tell from the unit placements on the map. That's my front line. We'll use a, a, a pink marker because I think it stands out more. That's my front line, right? Then I've got... Reserves. Got another reserve here. And you can see the distance to the front line is not that big. The idea here is that I can replace the front line, that the, and these men are far enough back to where they can remain fresh and not suffer too much collateral damage from musket fire and cannon fire, but they're close enough to the front where they can march forward and offer relief and reinforcement when it becomes necessary. So when you're doing the sort of an advanced maneuver, uh, that makes it sound like I'm really <laughs> the smartest man in the room. I'm not. When you're doing this sort of maneuver, this is how you want to stage it. You want to keep the reinforcements close, about this close, but you also want to keep them a little bit back so they don't get nailed. And also you could see here, I'll zoom out, um, you could tell where my army's going, uh, judging by the weight of it, right? So what's the classic line from Waterloo? His weight is on his left or something. Uh, all of my weight, look where it is. It's all here. And I just have this brigade of three units hanging out on the right. I've got effectively two, two to three ranks of shit over in this part of the battle. And this is just kind of, you know, one or two. And I don't even have full reserves moved up yet. These guys are all the way back here marching forward. That's who these guys are. So you can really tell the intent of someone, including me in this video, based on where they're putting their stuff. Anyway, let's press play. So this, I just get super lucky. I unlimber my battery, uh, basically, just as this is happening, and I catch uh, the Prussians out before they can really murder this battery. Um, and I, I start losing crew. I don't lose any of the guns, thank God, but I do manage to rout the musketeers, probably because they were just surrounded by the enemy, and I had just a bunch of stuff there and whatnot. Um, the Prussians are not really good in a bayonet charge like that on their own. Um, the French can kind of do a little bit better, as can the Russians, but these guys... They just didn't have it uh, as good as they wanted to. Now, my opponent uh, does a really good job of withdrawing his troops, and that's why I like this replay, because it's not just me flanking the shit out of someone. It's also somebody doing a really good job to avoid encirclement, because the danger here in this sort of a situation 
is that uh, while you're doing all this stuff over here and trying to move around here, right, what I can possibly do is using all these reserves, I can encircle them like I've drawn here. So any of these Prussians here, if I can get these reserves moved up, I can do an encirclement. But what the Prussian player is doing is he keeps withdrawing and withdrawing, and so the line is always moving back. And that means that he's able to effectively prevent all of these flanking maneuvers from happening because the second I get to threatening his flank, he moves back and it keeps happening. So as much as I, I'm showing you this video for the purposes of an education on how to properly do a flank turn, um, the reality is this is as much a video on how to do a turning movement as much as it is a tutorial on how to avoid encirclement. And this player does a really good job uh, making sure that they don't take any unnecessary casualties. He lost the fight for the hill, he couldn't get the gun, and if he had kept pressing, this gun would be firing canister point blank. But by pulling back, what he did was he saved the gun from um, basically being, uh, or rather, he saved his troops from being obliterated by close range cannon fire. So you may have seen this and think, oh, well, he's got four units, why doesn't he move forward to attack? Because he's at a disadvantage. I've got the flanks covered. I've got my heavy cavalry brigade moving over here. I've got light cavalry moving forward. My general's over here. I've got him overextended over here a little bit because we've got all these guys committed. This Prussian player, this is his whole line, right? All of his reserves are back here. He's only got land bear on his flank. So he's keeping his cards close to his chest. This is very cool. Now you could see uh, the reserves that I'm moving forward. This brigade here, this is my uh, fusilier. Uh, uh, these are my fusiliers. I've got my conscripts moving forward. Now you might be thinking, well, I'm very lucky that he doesn't have cavalry to frontally charge me. And you're right. But also part of the reason why I'm keeping my heavy cavalry over here is because I want to prevent that. Now here's a really cool thing. Um, I noticed that he's got Landwehr in the trees and I've got heavy cavalry and Landwehr cannot square. So watch this. Now in doing that, what I'm what I'm giving my units time to do is advance. I'm robbing these Landwehr battalions. As cool as that was and as awesome as that was, my thinking was they can't square and that's a lot of firepower. Um, my cavalry may not be able to route that. I'll kill a lot of them and I did, almost 50% attrition. But what I'm really trying to do is give my men time to get into position and start firing. Now here's another uh, thing that I do is by having conscripts in the front line um, and by kind of forcing my opponent to extend here, um, they're trying to do uh, they're trying to do a lot all at once, and they don't really have the units to do that. Now, there's something really cool going on here, which is the square to be able to shoot in both directions. How awesome is that? Um, but I'm going to try to trade. Um, I've got conscripts, and I'm moving forward all of my reserves. Look at this movement. So, <clears throat> I'm moving everything that I have forward. I'll use blue for the French. So, this is my reserve. This is my next front line I'm moving forward, and this is my current front line, and I'm hopscotching them all forward. And the idea here is I'm going to press into the enemy as hard as I can here because this is a pretty thin line. But you could see what I'm doing here. I'm staging the attack. Um, I'm not doing any crazy unit stats thing. I just have the cheapest troops in front, the worst troops, being followed up with the actually good quality troops. And then I have my uh, really seasoned veteran brigades following up behind them. So I'm not really doing anything crazy. This is not like extremely technical maneuvering. It's just keeping the expensive shit in the back, throwing the cheap shit on the front line, and then having my general nearby for the morale support. Again, these are not really that advanced tactics. You gotta realize this is the pre-radio day of combat. Keep it simple. You can't overcomplicate a battle plan. Washington was famous for trying to do complicated shit during the Revolutionary War, and it never, it rarely worked out. Now what I'm doing here, uh, again, this is a tutorial video, so I'm pointing this stuff out. I'll take a sip of my beer. Mm -mm. What I'm trying to do over here on this side is I'm using my conscripts to charge this squared unit of foot guards. And then uh, this life regiment. The reason I'm doing that is because I saw them in square and a unit in square is very vulnerable to a bayonet. That's because only a quarter of the men in the unit are exposed to the enemy. So your uh, unit, your red charging regiment can usually receive vastly diminished fire on the approach. Only about a quarter, maybe a little bit more depending on the side exposed. But here, this is a pretty flat angle, as you can see. So I'm the amount of fire I'll, reduce, I'll, I'll receive uh, closing the distance is vastly reduced. 
And also it means that I can really swamp this. And then if I get inside the square, I can actually apply a flanking bonus to attacking the interior of the square, and that really hurts morale. So my general over here is going to inspire this conscript unit. Now, I remember this because I right-clicked on the unit during the battle. This unit, I believe, has something like six or just a small melee uh, attack by itself. When I inspire it, that melee will go up to 24. So I have a 24 uh, melee uh, unit slamming into here. Now, I only have three inspires, so this is a very finite thing, but that's a very expensive unit. They cost about triple, if not quintuple, the amount of this unit, and they're helping to keep this flank alive. So between these two units, the uh, Life Grenadiers and then the uh, Eighth Life Regiment, if I can get rid of these three, I can really collapse morale on this side. So that's something I'm willing to do. I'm willing to spend and inspire on this unit to get them in, and I think I'm able to do it, so I'm going to try to make it happen while the cuirassier are holding up that side. You can see my general is going to stay to the front. Only taking one casualty on the approach. Let's watch the numbers. They're at 200. Wow, look at how quick that drops. That's a guard unit too, so they already down 10, 12, 14, 15 men. Look at how quickly they start losing men. Wow, look at that, 25 already down. Jesus, look at that. How crazy is that? And I am still at 200 and, 200 and change. While my conscripts are definitely being chewed up because they're fighting a, a foot guard battalion, they've definitely attrited the motherfuck out of it. Now, my cuirassiers have done their job. They've cleared a hole. They've forced the landwehr to retreat. Some, some of them are shattered. Um, so we've cleared out this flank, but what we've done is we've managed to really uh, do some damage to the side. So now what I'm doing is I'm moving up all of my reserves with the intent of relieving the front line because I don't really have a lot going on over here. Uh, my enemy is putting a lot of stuff on the front line. And uh, I've got this beleaguered conscript unit out there just basically engaging and soaking up fire. But we managed to rout the foot guard battalion with these conscripts who, although taking a lot of casualties, do manage to score their weight back in guard units. And that's the trade I'm willing to do. Now, we do also get the Life Grenadiers in melee, but again, that's a good trade. This is not a bad thing, right? Conscripts fighting two different elite units, routing one. I'll gladly lose this Conscript unit if it means I can do some damage to this unit and then do some damage to this one. Now, you may notice that the Lifeguards are suffering a lot of casualties in this melee, or were rather. Um, that's because this unit is still inspired, so they're still doing damage. Now, my French Hussars are going to move in and try to slam into this Landwehr, and they do dealing quite a substantial amount of frontal damage. My Hussars here are going to exploit the fact that these uh, guards cannot form square. Now, here's uh, my mistake. Here's my mistake, is look at how slow I am to move up my reserves. This is a mistake on my part. I'm focusing way too much on the cavalry micro, micro to capitalize off of this, so I'm losing precious time. What I should be doing is moving forward these reserves continuously to outflank. Instead, I'm losing men in a costly firefight. So this is a mistake on my part, actually. Um, you do, don't do what I'm doing here, which is getting caught up in the moment. Keep your eyes on the prize. The cavalry stuff, yeah, this is great. This wasn't really necessary. This is just me kind of getting a little piebald here. I finally get my ass in gear and start moving up to continue the flank. But by the time I do that, the enemy has decided to retreat. I could have been online sooner. So this costs us valuable time, and my enemy is able to move back to the de next defensive line, which is this ridge. Now, if you look at this ground here, this is a really nice ridge and it looks down into this sloping area. So now I've got to kind of fight uphill to try and push the enemy off and do another flank. That's pretty, pretty, pretty friggin' annoying. So while I do seize the ground, I do take this hill. I do manage to pull my cavalry back, uh, who have suffered a lot and are tired, but they'll come back thanks to the new fatigue system. Um, I've given my enemy enough time to regroup accidentally. So again, um, Excellent job with force preservation over here. Um, I've definitely won in terms of casualties, but I, I let my enemy escape, and that's a problem. Now over here, let's kind of switch over here to this side of the battle. You can see how much the line is curved over here. Um, it really, it started here, and then it bent forward to here. So you can kind of see what I'm doing in this, in this uh, northern sector of the battle. Now, my enemy down here is doing a good job. He's engaging in a cannon duel, basically, with the enemy. Um, he's got horse artillery, which are a pretty small target, uh, firing into a uh, Prussian three-pound foot battery. The three-pounder doesn't have the best accuracy, so it's going to struggle to hit. Um, but this six-pound gun, 
Sorry, I actually, think, I think that's a six-pound gun. I think that's what horse artillery is. The French one, anyway. They'll have better accurate. They have better accuracy, and they're going to probably be able to dismount more guns. They've already taken out one, so the firepower of that battery is reduced by twenty-five percent. Um, but Jesus. But you know, a bit of a duel here. So my opponent is, or my ally down here is doing a good job avoiding a direct confrontation before they win the artillery duel. However, not for long, because the Prussians are moving in. Down here, the Austrians have begun engaging the French in a line battle. Wow, look at all that. How cool is that? Let's see the, re let's see the return volley. Ooh, you can see all the shots. You can see the, the pans firing off and the new musket effects so of the unburnt powder sizzling out of the barrels when it fires. How cool. How awesome. Man, there must be leaves falling off of these trees. If this was like a real battle story, what would be happening is these trees, there'd be leaves falling down, branches would be snapped in half, birds would be falling from them that they're after being hit by the musket balls if they hadn't flown from the field already. Uh, you, there are tons of accounts of trees being whittled in half by the weight of fire going through forests. It happened during the Civil War, it happened during these wars. There are trees on battle, that's bullets hitting the ground over there, that's what that is. Um, there are accounts in tons of, uh, musket-era wars where trees get just eventually sawed in half by the lead flying through the air. Man, what a battlefield. Oh, Battalion Mass here from the Austrians doing something, not sure what. But my enemy's getting pressed in and he's being attrited pretty significantly by the enemy. Uh, his artillery, it seems to have, uh, left the field. Um, not terribly sure why. But over here, I'm now moving forward to the next advance. Now, this is a very specific thing that I'm doing. So if we pull out our handy-dandy writing tool here, um, I'm moving these regiments forward, and I have a firing line set up, and we're going to get a few volleys off and receive a few volleys. Do you see all the smoke over here? Or the uh, dirt hitting here. I'm moving my general up to inspire, because what I'd like to do is I'd like to break the line here. I want to create a gap. Um, now, as I said before, we are charging uphill, you may recall. So it's going to be tough. But I'm going to hold fire here. Now, as I'm charging up, I'm going to reposition my units. As you can see, that unit that was here, this regiment's going to move forward. This unit will also move forward. I'm going to run them the last few yards and then have them commit to the charge. Now I'm using my Fusilier, so this is a good unit. Now my opponent wisens up and inspires his unit and has them charge downhill, so the momentum is actually taken from me, but it does the effect of engaging the enemy in melee. Now I'm really moving hard into this area here now. This is a problem because I am getting a little flanked. But what I have the privilege of being able to do, because I've been so conservative with my cavalry, is move in to threaten this side. So even though he may be flanking me, I have all of these reserves to move in, my veteran lines. So this is my veteran brigade moving in, and I have my cavalry to move in here. So I'm going to take away my enemy's micro and put it on this side, while at the same time moving in lines to deal with it. So although I'm getting flanked in the immediate term, what I am getting off is uh, the ability to kind of threaten my enemy. And I do manage to charge in and steal a unit with his micro being distracted. He does manage to form square with another unit, if I recall correctly, but I do at least get a charge off on these Brunswickers, which is quite nice. And that's going to give me time to get more units into this action. Now this is a problem though, because as you can see, he's actually managing to repel my charge, so I need to fall back and recalibrate my line a little bit. Um, it's a bit of a dangerous situation, I'm trying to hold him back, he's actually won this, so a bit of a setback in terms of this engagement in the center. Uh, because this unit had charged downhill, but my Fusiliers are holding the line, and they're fighting two very attrited units. And, uh, although I do manage to kill uh, a unit of Brunswickers off, if I recall correctly. I'm not sure. I, I at least got one of them, because I got these guys. Um, I am going to throw both units at this square. I'm not going to wait to, uh, charge or shoot. I'm just going to throw them into this unit and try to kill them. Um, now this is not really, I want to clarify something, this is not spamming charges. As you can see, I'm in, this is my, these are my oh, units as well over here, a little bit. Um, I am engaged in a line battle, I am stopping to shoot, I am using fire to damage the enemy. But I'm doing charges in very specific moments where I've caught out an enemy and I just want to push him off the field, I want to use the bayonet to route him. Um, oh here's the other Brunswicker unit, yeah I've got my Kirasie, I've got Mira stabbing him. And I'm moving in my, uh, 18E to kill off the rest of them. I'm using the bayonet to stop an enemy from firing or to push them off the field and cut off pieces of the enemy army. I've caught out basically a brigade's worth of Brunswickers and I forced the enemy to use two regiments to repel a charge. So while I am definitely taking casualties, look I've lost a lot of men to fire here, I've lost a lot of men to fire there, I've lost men to fire here. 
um, I have managed to, I think, ultimately win this position. And now my Hussars are kind of pulling around the enemy, and I am managing to do a lot of damage that way. I'm sneaking in a unit of Fusiliers here before they manage to run in the square. Meanwhile, over here, a battle of attrition. The Austrians are winning, and my ally in the center is forced to pull up his reserves and his elites. Um, I'm not too sure this was the wisest tactic. I think he could have used the bayonet to charge in here. I also think uh, he could have perhaps been more aggressive on my flank with his own bayonet charges instead of getting in this line fight. Fighting German Fusiliers is never a good idea because they just have more men than you. And, uh, or at least better accuracy than the French lines do, and you could see he's being shut off the field. So as much success as I'm having over here, you could see where the lines have shifted. We're losing the attrition battle in the center. Meanwhile on the right... Oh, is there a charge going on? Oh, the French got charged. Interesting. Very interesting. Hungarian Hussars charging the French. Oh, the Swiss. Oh, unfortunate. So, uh, so yeah, the Austrians are countercharging in the center, and they're trying to break it. So as, as much success as I'm having over here, our center is in a lot of trouble. Now, in this circumstance, my enemy quits their position again. We do force them off, and you can see the damage that we've wrought on them from the gunfight, and you can also see the damage that they've done to us in the gunfight, too. Um, and while you may be thinking, okay, you're kind of static right now, what's going on? I am moving forward. Now, here's the problem. Um, I'm losing a lot of energy doing this. Uh, as you can see, I'm leaving units in reserve to recoup energy, but my flanks are now tired from having to commit to a charge, so I gotta let the men rest a little bit. My cavalry are all tired. So I'm leaving them back a little bit to regain, but I'm using these two squadrons to uh, uh, Hussars because they just by default move fast to force my enemy to form a square. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just wheedling them back and forth. Accidentally, I walk into the square here for a second. Oops. But I am forcing the enemy to deploy into square, and what that's doing is it's stopping them from moving, and it's giving my units time to catch up. So you can see I've always got my reserves moving forward. I've actually moved the battery that I had back here over here. So I've used the, the free area to march. So the turning movement is going well. We've got some time left on the clock. Little under uh, a half an hour of gameplay has transpired. But our center has effectively begun collapsing and the Austrians are really winning on that side. Over on the right, the French and the Prussians are just in a battle duking it out on the road. Not as aggressive gameplay going on here, but they are managing to win it. The French are running conscripts over here to this uh, southern part, probably to block um, the advance of these musketeers. A very uh, energy-depleting maneuver. I honestly didn't watch too much down here when I was playing the game, so it's kind of cool to watch, but... What's happening here is my allies are holding the line. Holding the line while I am doing my aggressive maneuvering up here. Now, going back to my flank, what I'm doing is I'm forming, I'm making the enemy form square. And look, he hasn't been able to move because I just keep threatening cavalry. And while I am taking some casualties from gunfire, a few uh, horses on the ground, you could see how close my regiments have gotten. Now, these are active, if not fresh, uh, regiments. And so the problem is becoming I have tired units pursuing units with much more energy, I accidentally walk in again. Um, because I'm not really trying to do a charge. I think I do manage to charge and break this square. I do lose men on this, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I do lose some riders. But I just kill enough of these guys to where I actually do manage to break the square. Yeah, it's nice. So, finally, through a weight of cavalry alone, I break it. Um, which is nice. But again, I am losing men to this sort of a thing. Um, it's not a clean break. But again, because I'm forcing enemy to form square, look at how close I've been able to move my lines. Now, over here, we'll pause for a second, because I want to show something with the Austrians. Look at where the Austrian strength is. So they have this front line here, and they've got one, two, maybe, you know, three units over here, so we'll put two. So they got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they got nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So that's one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's eight over there. Well, actually, nine, so... We'll do nine. And then over here, they got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They've got eight units over here. So while it's almost a 50-50 split, look at how compact these guys are compared to how spread they are over here. Look at the distance in uh, frontage here. Um, on the left, we have a line of battle on this side. Um, let me get rid of some of these lines here because now they're starting to get a little cluttered. On the left, we have a line of battle. And we'll denote that with this magenta pen. 
where they're just doing the fighting, and then indicated with the blue pen, blue plant, blue pen, bleh, we have this really concentrated assault column. And while there is kind of a match going on on this side in terms of the line, the French are vastly outnumbered in this quadrant of the battlefield over here. So there's quite a substantial concentration of Austrian troops pressing into here, breaking the French center. Also of note, circled in yellow, look who that is. That's the general. You could tell where the intent of an enemy is based on where their general is, because the general is providing morale to all these units by his proximity, while he's a little too far away to reach all the guys over here. So the Austrian center is really trying hard to break the French center, and it looks like they're affecting a breakthrough, because now there's a bit of a gap, actually, that's been created, um, denoted in yellow, where the Austrians are kind of creating, um, you know, a hole. And what's happening is now they're marching in, and my flank here is going to become exposed. Now, I'm lucky because I still have quite a majority of my army left. But this is dangerous because it means that I'm effectively cut off from my allies. And this is the danger with flanking. So with flanking, the way to affect, to, to, um, to really hurt a flanking, a turning maneuver like I'm doing, right? And I'll use a blue pen to denote this. If this is where the line was, and I moved all the way over here, right? The line continues down here. The way to hurt a flank using yellow to denote the Austrian efforts, the way to hurt a flank attempt is to cut it off, to poke a hole. Because now anything to the left or right of this is disconnected, and that means that I'm effectively on my own over here. So I have flanked, but the Austrian attack in the center here has disconnected my flank attack. So now I'm on my own. And that can be really dangerous if I was more heavily attrited because then the Austrians could let the Prussians really focus on wearing me out, wearing me out. But luckily what I've done is I've managed to preserve all my artillery. I still have all my guns left. I've got four up here and I've got four over here. Um, and meanwhile, uh, the Prussians are basically becoming surrounded. Um, but they've got the Austrians holding back the French from really completing the encirclement here. And also they're falling back on some Austrian guns. So the front line is over here, and if I don't figure out how to deal with these guns, I will be receiving canister fire pretty soon, depending on how much I advance. But also, if we look at the points, this house and this house are firmly controlled by the coalition. The French do not have any sort of influence over this. So right now, the enemy is winning. You can see how thin the French lines are. Yeah, he's pulling back with whatever he's got left. 62 men, 54, 67 receiving artillery fire. General staff's even taking some hits. Not a lot of men left, not a lot of gas left in that tank. I'm addressing my lines and I'm realizing I have to play defensively on the right and fend off the enemy and I've got artillery shooting in. Putting some nice holes in the target. Making them waver even. Um, but over here, I'm trying to play aggressively. And you could see, again, what I'm doing is I'm just forcing the Prussian player to form square constantly. I did- I actually had no Inspires left in this moment, so I just decided rather than lose these guys in a line battle, I- I had more men than the enemy. I wanted to charge the Brunswickers. Jesus. So, that's what I did. I charged the Brunswickers with one French unit. I'm moving up my general. I'm moving up cavalry. Blucher moved up. Blucher has a better morale bonus than Sult the, er, Ney does. But what I'm doing is I'm just tying up the enemy while I move in. Now, here's where reserves come into handy. Look at all the stuff I have in reserve. These are all fresh units for the most part. Um, these guys are attrited 50%, sure, but this regiment is relatively fresh. 191 out of 230. And then my guards division, or guard brigade, is rather good. The young guard, 193 out of 200. Um, Dutch Grenadiers, 198 out of 200. Basically fresh. The Prussians have some strong units, but nothing too fresh. And I actually do manage to make a, a, a route on this side. Mira going in, what a badass. And I'm sending in my cuirassier who get lucky because I guess my opponent- Ooh, except for those guys. Jesus. But I am going to sneak this battery using my cavalry while I have the opening gap and before the enemy can fall in the line with it. Not a good day to be that gunner, getting hacked to pieces by the Trumpeteer. Now, the problem is the Austrians have really begun hammering this side, but, again, using the principles of artillery I explained before, 
Look at this awesome shot I have. Look at the amount of men I can hit with a cannonball here. If the angle is even steeper, I can hit even more men. So I've got a really good angle for artillery to shoot on this side. And then I have this unit guarding the flank to make sure that this Fusilier Battalion can't come in. So this is kind of a bit of a wet dream for me in terms of uh, targeting. I'm just getting really lucky catching out a bunch of stuff. So now um, I've not only flanked the position and seized this hill for sure, and now my artillery's on it thankfully, but I've switched positions because now look, I my flank has been cut off by the Austrians. So now I'm on my own and we have a problem. Yes, I flanked the Prussians, but now the Austrians are able to send reinforcements in. And while I do have an artillery battery up here able to offer fire support, um, I have a lot of big problems to deal with. And I'm not really uh, able to put as much bodies, as many bodies on the line as I'd like to make this happen. Now my opponent is using the low rise to try and hold this position. He's going to try to get me off of this hill with the bayonet, but luckily... He is in canister range. Oh, all a canister hitting the ground. Jesus. Whoa. Jesus. That'll take care of that unit. So the guns on my flank actually help secure it, which is nice. And my cavalry maneuver elements are giving me a lot of options here. And again, Prussians pulling back. What I'm intentionally doing now is I'm just holding back. I've taken the position I wanted, I've done the flank that I wanted, now what I'd like to do is just bombard the ever-living shit out of the enemy. Because if we look at the gunnery position here, look at the target that I've got in this lane of fire. One, two, three, four, five different enemy regiments walking through. And as you could see, that was a hell of a shot that just hit the ground. Jesus, yeah, the ball's just bouncing and running through these units. Um, oh man, look, look at all the damage we did over here, disrupting formations and whatnot. And that's morale damage, too. I'm gonna use my artillery to, uh, fire enfilade, and you can see I'm not moving my units up fast enough to get in the way of my artillery. I'm leaving intentionally a gap here, and also I want my men to rest a little bit. Unfortunately, though, um, we are losing in other parts of the battlefield. So in the south, the French are doing well, we're fighting a battle of attrition, but we're losing it. Uh, we are not doing well in the south. Um, the French are just not able to hold the line down here. There is a bit of a bayonet charge uh, trying to be made, but I just don't think it, it's going to get off the ground. Meanwhile, over here, the French are basically getting uh, eroded. Even Archduke Charles is running around the enemy line. So what I'm doing is I'm just threatening the enemy position, making them form square. Again, just to try to out-micro them. And now the Prussians are actually going to evacuate this area. Look at the artillery hits that are coming in this... Oh my god. Let's see where these cannonballs go. We're gonna send in the ATE one more time. Winded, so they've gotten some energy back to try to route these fusiliers. Fusiliers are light infantry, so we can kill them in melee. Yes, French player falling into a fusilier battalion mass, which is quite nice. But the, the situation is rather awful, and you'd be you'd be right for thinking. Oh, nice rally pop here by that Austrian general. You'd be correct in thinking that my flank was for naught, because, yes, while the Prussians are effectively removed from the field. Let me have a sip of the, my German beer as I say this. While the Prussians are effectively removed from the field, they're combat um, incapable right now. Awkward charge by the Colonial Battalion. They're on a high ground. I have enfilade artillery running into them. The Prussian player has done a fantastic job preserving his force. But I don't really have a lot of an army left. I've got a lot of stuff that are tired. Um, I'm moving in my uh, elite brigade of Young Guard and um, Dutch Grenadiers. Um, but I'm losing men. I'm running out of energy. My 18E are attrited. That's one of my favorite and best units. And while they're doing a good job, they've killed two units of the enemy, arguably three, possibly four. 
We just don't have the numbers yet. My cap left. My cavalry are tired, if not winded, and I'm letting them rest on this flank. You can see, um, you know, they've gone up to winded from tired. Um, look at how many units the Austrians still have waiting in the wings. So I'm going to have to deal with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven regiments of Austrian infantry being pulled up in reserve. Whoa. Getting off a lot of good kills on this regiment as they vacate the position. So the Prussians are off the field. I've beaten the Prussians, which is nice. That is how you do a turning movement, right? You don't stay in one area for long. You don't engage in combat unless you really need to. You only do the bayonet charging where you need to make it happen. Um, recognizing where to do a bayonet charge and where to move reserves is a really important part of um, a flank maneuver. Now I have to deal with the Austrians. However, I do get off some slamming artillery hits because now my battery is up there and now this battery is also shooting. So, oh, I think it was a person that just flew by. Jesus, look at how big that hole is. My God. So while I am, um, oh, did I try to sneak? Oh, I guess, I, oh, I had Hussars go for Blucher. Yeah, because I wanted to kill Blucher. While I do have a lot of reserves, uh, there's just a lot of Austrians. So now I need to defend. So what I'm doing is I'm using this ridge this high ground with the officer with the heat. Pulling my grenadiers off the line, this is an intentional decision because I'd like these conscripts to be where they are. See what I'm doing? Force preservation. Now the Austrians are moving in. The Austrians are mostly fresh, and I have a lot of tired men doing this, and they've got a vastly larger battle line than me. So if they decide to envelop me, which they will, they're bringing up another brigade's worth of infantry in back here as well. Um, this is a very dangerous position for me. Now luckily, I have several hundred men in reserve, including several fresh units. I'm letting these guys uh, rest for a little bit, and as you can see, they're back up to fresh. So I have a lot of men resting right now. Uh, this unit of colonial troops are uh, resting. My cavalry's been resting. Now they're back from tired to active. Um, I'm just trying to hold them off for right now and let my army rest, but I'm pulling back from the main firefight because there's nothing to gain here. They're trying to shoot me off of this. And I want my artillery to leverage as much work as possible. As I said, I'm not engaging in needless firefights. I'm just trying to keep my men alive and you let the artillery do some damage. I don't need to hold this ridge line. I'm threatening control of this town. I'm just trying to do damage. Now, unfortunately, I am firing at the hillside here, which is kind of an oversight on my part. But hey, if I can't see them, they can't see me. So all's well that ends well. Again, I should be holding fire and waiting for them to crest this hill. So I decide, okay, a possible potential opportunity here. I'm moving in all of my reserve brigades. I want to crack this Austrian line. I move up my general. Everyone's moving up. And while I am tired, I'm asking the man for one last effort. Archduke Charles is off to the side. I think I can nail these fusiliers. Abandon Austrian guns. Now this was a bit preemptive of me, but... I did want to try to keep the Austrians back. Now this is where player psychology comes in. Um, you'd be surprised how much player psychology comes into games like this, because you're looking at this and if you do the math here, 
Uh, this front line here is really, really weak. Th these guys are tired, these guys are tired, these guys are tired or winded. This is a very small unit, and like, look at it, how much stuff they have over here, and this coming in. Um, I'm really not that strong on this side, unless you account for this stuff in the back and my cavalry waiting over here in the trees resting. The Austrians probably could have stayed and done some firefighting and won, but they're very, very cautious because I think they were a little afraid of me and they were worried that I was on the high ground down below. Um, so they're going to go back and kind of find some high ground themselves off of this sunken road. So now this is my idea of a final assault. I'm doing a frontal assault up this hill in echelon. Fusiliers followed by Young Guard followed by Dutch Grenadiers. I am going to slam into that division. My artillery is providing cover fire. The Prussians are staying in reserve over here. The Austrian left sitting tight. I'm moving my general up. This is like the last attack of the French, basically, is what this comes down to. Flag shot. Now, big problem. Big problem. I'm wavering here and I route. The Fusiliers get repel repelled by the Germans. The Prussians are coming in to offer a flank opportunity. Now, I am going to get an inflate shot off on them by my troops in the cliff here. But this is a dangerous situation. I've had to deploy uh, a battered brigade here to repel the enemy. They are afraid of my cavalry, so they formed square. I'm just trying to hold off. I need to make a breakthrough happen here, and I'm starting to make progress. The Dutch Grenadiers are really hard fighting, and they managed to kill off that big unit of German Fusiliers. Now they're going to go in, and, but uh, the Young Guard actually get repelled. They get repelled by German Fusiliers, which is unfortunate. So now it comes down to the Dutch Grenadiers. Can the Dutch Grenadiers really make it happen? I'm taking some pretty non-replaceable losses right now. Um, this is a very dangerous situation. I'm going to use my general as cavalry even a little bit to try and make something happen. And I do manage to actually get into the back of those fusiliers and make them route. And this is the dangerous thing with Austria, is once they start routing, it's really, really hard for them to stop routing. Now, even though this unit formed a square, it looks like, it was just the weight of the cavalry slamming into them that does it. I'm going to commit everything I have in terms of cavalry here to try and break this center, and I do that finally successfully. Um, the point of doing this is now I've created a hole. However, I don't really have a lot of stuff to put over here. I'm getting routed, but men are coming back. But look at how many uh, Hungary, uh, some fresh Austrians are coming around this corner. It's a very dangerous situation, and I'm pulling back. Um, now, Hans's general does get caught here. Blücher was dismounted. I do manage to ride him down with Mira. So that means the Prussians are going to break, because now they don't have a general. But I do lose my French Grenadiers in this melee. My Dutch Grenadiers are coming back, but now they're very tired. Um, I'm fighting a, a square with cavalry. Murat's just trying to wade into the square, and he's actually doing that rather successfully. I don't know if that's a glitch or something, but I've got um, Ney riding down a unit of the uh, Deutsch Imperial Guard, and I'm trying to flank this enemy line and get enfilade. This is a very desperate, very, very desperate situation. Um, and I'm, I'm just reforming my line just as swiftly as it breaks over here. I can't hold these Austrians. So I lost a lot here. Uh, I lost two regiments out of the three I sent in, but by committing all of my cavalry, keeping my fire base up here, sending in my general for direct morale support, um, and having the Dutch Grenadiers come in. The Dutch Grenadiers are just a fantastic unit. I do manage to carry this position, and the Dutch Grenadiers will finish off this unit of German Fusiliers with Ney watching. But over here, uh, the conscripts are going to go in and try to hold the line, and the, the thing is, as you may think, this is a very dangerous situation. I do still have a four-gun battery of 12-pounders firing into this. And of all things, Archduke Charles gets killed by conscripts who shatter immediately after bayoneting Charles as his general staff gets shot off his horse by a cannonball, lol. So Charles gets routed, and the Austrians are very dependent upon their general for morale, and it's kind of like killing the vampire leading the skeleton army with the Austrians. Once you kill the necromancer, all the undead go back to being dead. So finally, all the Austrians get routed off the field, which is quite nice, um, but that's not really the end of the game.
because the final chapter. The Prussians are still on the field under Scharnhorst. The French have been defeated on this flank, unfortunately, but they've done a lot of damage. However, they have a bunch of fresh Prussian units. So if we run the numbers on this, we've got 222, 60, so two, about 300 men, 350, uh, about two, uh, 420, blaze it. Uh, I, I fucked my math up, hold on. 220, 60, that's 280, 280 plus 60, uh, we're looking at 340 plus another 80. Uh, what is that? Uh, 420, yeah, 420 plus another 120. That's 104, uh, 540 plus another 140. You're looking at 680 uh, plus, that's 700 and change. You're looking at almost a thousand Prussians led by uh, an alive general, Scharnhorst, who is a really good general. He's a three-star Prussian general, if I recall rightly. Uh, and they still have a bunch of elites. They've got their uh, foot guard battalion. They've got their musketeers. Uh, they've got a grenadier battalion. They've also got the 8th life regiment. So you've got two elites with a bunch of stuff and a lot of a chevron coming up here. And the French player has fallen back entirely. They've got their, ge their general staff and then just some cuirassier in the woods. Actually, I think this might be my stuff. Um, yeah, because we, yeah, so the, the Austrians were routed. Sorry to get back to my thing. I've got my conscripts acting as guards for the artillery, and some Austrians are trying to rally, but they're just under a constant artillery bombardment, so they're not really able to come back, so they're just there to annoy me. So now I'm using the roads to march my men up to these points. Um, yeah, here we go, the two surviving French units, the middle guard and the young guard from down here. These are not my units, these came from over here, the southern division of the French. They are going to come back and try to hold this house while these thousand Prussians come in. So now the question becomes, when you're as attritted as I am, we're fighting a thousand, we have 50, uh, 140, uh, 170, 260, 350, what is that, 480? Uh, less than a thousand. I'd say maybe seven, eight hundred men, plus some cavalry. And we've got Austrians in the back. What's the real difference here? Well, I'll tell you what the real difference is. We have cavalry, which is very helpful. But more importantly, we have artillery. I finally remember to limber up this gun. And I'm moving it forward. And I'm going to remember to limber up this gun and move it forward. And this is why preserving artillery and keeping it safe and sound is so goddamn important. Because these guys are fresh, and my what's left of my division is kind of fresh. But a lot of it is tired. Tired, very tired. Tired, winded. Tired. Only these two are fresh. That unit is fresh, but a lot of other stuff is tired. My cavalry is depleted. They're resting. They've gone from tired to active, but it's hard to say if they're reliable or not. These cuirassiers are tired. Very tired. The young guard are very tired. Everything over here is mostly fresh. So we're asking a lot of the men that we have left. Giving you all a second to read, answering a text. Second to breathe. This is the scariest Prussian unit. This unit of 222 musketeers. This is a very fresh unit. Oh, the bayonets look so good. Wow. You might look at uh, these casualties and these units and think, ah, oh, this is unrealistic. You know, 60 men out of 200 remaining. P. Shaw. Well, you know, the 37th Virginia, if I recall the name of the regiment correctly, during the American Civil War, surrendered with Robert Lee at Appomattox Courthouse at the end of the war in 1865, the American Civil War in 1865. And they had, if I remember the number correctly, they had 37 men and two officers left. 37 men and two officers left of a regiment that probably started the war with maybe a thousand or more and got reinforcements. But by the end of five years of fighting, after all the hundreds of reinforcements they'd probably gotten, they left the last battle of the Army of Northern Virginia with less than 50 men. Are these casualties really that unrealistic? I don't necessarily know. We have taken the building, sir. 
All right, so what I'm doing over here is I'm stacking this house. The reason I'm stacking this house is I'm giving my very tired army uh, time to rest. Now, this is a bit of a sad situation because while we're holding this house, uh, these, these two units are still very tired. Um, my ally has, uh, his middle guard in there, but, uh, I've got a, a unit, uh, I think these are my fuselers, I've got them off to the house to provide fire support and just do some damage to the Prussians as they march up. But, uh, th this is just a, an honor guard for the house, really. These guys are gonna quit the field pretty soon. Grenadier is going in. Forcing entry. Oh. Oh. Brutal. How's my artillery doing? I'm moving it forward and you can see the position I'm getting it in. Now, why is this position good? Well, look at what's in front of us. The whole Prussian line. Oh my god, that's why that unit is scary. What a shot. Sometimes being far away from the battle, just looking on, is impressive. Our men are running, sir. Yeah, that Fuselier unit routed. Woof. Kirasie making a run for Scharnhorst. My own Kirasie tried to make a move on this musketeer unit and got routed. I formed a square here to try to hold this flank as long as possible. These Fusiliers are trying to hold off, defend this side of the house as long as they can, but the French inside the middle guard are just not doing that well. Now, I've begun forming out of the house. I've let my units rest a little bit. And while they're still tired, they're better than exhausted or totally, uh, very tired. So they s they took this house. Now, there's not a lot of time left in the game. Not a lot of time left in the game, and I don't really have the numbers to push them off. I don't have the cavalry anymore. We've lost our cavalry. They have a general. They've got a bunch of fresh troops. This is a difficult situation, but what do we have? Guns. Eight of them. And how lovely is that? So, we've got a good elevation. And now we're gonna let him have it. <laughs> oh man. What a shot. <laughs> Jeez, that, that deformed a lot of it. So we're using our artillery to batter the position, and here's my logic. Look at how much time we have left. I can move forward and get into a little bit of a firefight. As long as I prevent them from moving off this hill. Jesus Christ. As long as I prevent them from moving off this hill, I can use my artillery, and I'm being very careful with my line to make sure that I keep the artillery in a position. Or the, uh, the infantry in a position to not block the artillery line of fire. But what I'd like to do is just prevent the Prussians from moving off of this flank and going this way. Because if they do, then they can put my infantry between my artillery and the target. See what I mean? Woof. Jesus Christ. I will lose this firefight. I do not have enough men. But the morale damage of being hit with eight 12-pound cannons repeatedly does a lot. I'm not trying to go for a bayonet charge. I'm deploying reserves to get men online to fire. I don't think I could win a bayonet fight right now. I'm tired, mostly active, if anything. Um, but I, I'm pulling back, and I'm pulling back to give my guns line of fire. I'm, I'm leveraging my artillery. Artillery doesn't define a battle, 
until you get to situations like this, where your infantry is depleted. My young guard is down to 71 men, my conscript's 81. <laughs> my my the 18th uh, line regiment is down to 33 men. Uh, I'm just battering them using the artillery. They will win this shootout if it continues. What I need to do is just keep pummeling them with the artillery. Those white flashes you see are bullets going high. Wow. That's the, that's the angle of the shot. You see what I mean? Look at how many men that hit. Look at what the morale is like under this bombardment. Bit of a line glitch here, but... And that's it. The entire line's morale was... very shaken from that artillery. Oh, lol. So now I'm gonna move forward to make sure they can't regroup. My artillery is still hammering them as they route. My god. Sharnhorse get hit with that? Oh yeah, he did! Jesus. Sharnhorse just lost four staff to that. And now I'm just gonna have the artillery shoot the house for funsies. But yeah, I see they're reforming or trying to. That's why you gotta keep up the barrage, because you can't... Can't let them regroup. And that's really it. That's the exciting conclusion of the game, is I leverage this grand battery that I made. This is truly a grand battery, concentrating all your artillery in one position. I leveraged my grand battery to uh, make that last thing possible. And uh, now, again, this is not a gameplay video to show how awesome and good I am at the game. This is a video that I use to show people, that I'm trying to show people, how to play conservative, how to do a flank, and I really hope I achieved that. I hope you watch this video and you don't see an enemy being beaten, but rather you see what you need to do to make a turning movement happen. How close reserves need to be to the front line. Why you don't just constantly walk forward and engage the enemy, but you do so in a way that's advantageous. You know, you never walk into a fight unless you think you're going to win, especially against um, an entrenched static, static opponent. My cavalry did a great job, and this is why you play conservatively with cavalry, right? Like, I got 4,751 casualties. That's a really high casualty ratio. And if you look at the math here, um, my counterpart outnumbered me by more than 1,000. I was fighting Hans here by more than 1,000. And I bought that back with these two cavalry units. Cavalry is super important. You can't just spend it early in the battle. You want to keep it alive. Retreat it from a fight rather than let it grind itself out. Our team was really significantly outnumbered, and my allies did great. Um, if you look at the kills, they roughly broke even, um, and the enemy also did a fantastic job. Um, it was just a very maneuver-heavy game, and uh, I think that's kind of what you have to realize here, is that um, this mod is not a mod about um, killing the enemy as much as it is moving them off of the position, keeping them moving, and preserving your own force. I lost 3,000 men, and I was the last man on the field out of my army. And as you could see, it wasn't like I wasn't fighting. I was very heavily engaged. I was assaulting very aggressively in a turning movement. Um, I had to fight the Austrians. I could have lost that in three or four separate occasions, especially once the Austrians amputated my flank from the main French army. I managed to kind of turn my own flank. If my artillery wasn't alive, if I didn't manage to keep them alive, um, keep them in reserve, keep the artillery back, keep my cavalry alive, have that maneuver element to slow down the Prussian retreat and withdrawal, I could have lost this very easily. Um, I could have lost it right up until the end. These games, again, are not about killing the enemy. They are about preserving your force keeping as many of your men alive as possible. And I'll leave you with this. I think... I have a, th I have a working theory of this style of warfare. Now, granted, I, like this is Napoleon Total War. It's not a simulator. But I've played enough war games, I've played enough linear warfare games, video games, tabletop games, where I've noticed a theme in every game that I've played. And that theme comes down to force preservation. He who still has an army wins but even deeper even more important than that committing less mistakes than your enemy is the most important thing beyond anything 
don't make mistakes and you'll win. You don't have to do the right thing. Just don't make a mistake. These are two very different things. When people hear my state, uh, statement of, oh, just don't make mistakes, they think, oh, duh, you know, what, of course. But hear me out. Making a mistake is, or uh, not making a mistake is very different than doing the right thing, and here's why. Because if you do the right thing, you achieve success, you achieve your objective, whatever. But if you don't make a mistake, then if anything, you don't lose troops, you don't lose valuable assets, you don't lose artillery, you don't lose a cavalry squadron, you don't you lose a valuable infantry unit, you don't get your general killed in a silly way. It's better to not make a mistake than it is to do the right thing, because doing the right thing may put you in a position where you make a mistake if you're not set up for it properly. But if you focus on not making a mistake, not losing a unit in a silly way, you might find your opponent might make a misstep that plays into your hand. Just focus on keeping your shit together, keeping it alive, and not doing the wrong thing. And I think you'll find, more often than not, the situation will work out for you. During that game, I wasn't sitting there thinking about, you know, the what-ifs and how I'm going to screw over uh, the Prussian uh, northern flank and whatever. What I was thinking about is, okay, how do I prevent my men from dying and where is the opportunity to move? Um, again, it wasn't about doing the right thing. My head was thinking, okay, how do I prevent myself from making a mistake? And as you saw, I did a really good job of keeping my shit together, moving forward in a disciplined way, and ultimately winning the battle wasn't because I did the right thing. It's because I didn't make more, I didn't make more mistakes than my opponent. And that is a really fucking important thing. So yeah, uh, that's the game. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you appreciated it. And uh, if you stayed this long, as I said before, I'll only say this once, uh, like, and subscribe. So that way we can get to the, uh, um, community content creator tier of YouTube, wherever the fuck it is. And then we can get even more crazy shit for the channel. Anyway, thanks a bunch. Uh, today is Jan or January, wow, July 27th, 2022. It is a toasty 78 degrees Fahrenheit today. And oh boy, stay hydrated, stay safe, and I'll see you all around.